Tony's Red. This is a nice place. I didn't know that this is this club is here. that waited Holy on you last shit. night. Oh my God, what happened to yeah, him? He, he, 200 feet from his house, so, uh, someone hit him. Oh, how terrible. Yeah, the guy that took care of you last night. Oh, so he was um, really We'll terrible. take care of everyone. Uh, 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 the man that needs no introduction, that makes our room uh, look great. It looks like it was made for here, even though it looks great everywhere it hangs. But Mel is an absolute Trenton gem. Thank you so much for always including us in all of your artistic endeavors and journeys. Uh, you're the best. So, here you are, sir. Okay, I'm, uh, first I, I know that, I hope this doesn't sound stupid, but I, I have to start off with my age. Because I want this to be something to deal with uh, people who are my age or older even. I'm 87 now. And these paintings, almost all these paintings were done in the last two years. And I am still painting every day. And the only painting that goes back to uh, 2019 is the painting I did of the mayor. And uh, since this is, in a sense, a homage to the city of Trenton, I've, you know, and he couldn't come to my show in New York when this was shown, uh, I decided that it would be really good if it was, uh, if it was shown here, uh, too. So, uh, I, and I'll say what I would say at the end, really. I find uh, being an artist, doing anything creative, anything, cooking, tending a garden, doing anything, but just not sitting and watching television, <laughs> that will kill you, I'll tell you the truth. But the thing is, it, it's, such, it's so life-giving, it's incredible. And I'm very thankful, uh, now that I've gotten older, I've become really somewhat religious. I think it's all God's doing. In fact, I feel almost to tell you the truth that God is responsible for intuition 
where the fuck does it get pardon my English does it come from? Why do you all of a sudden get up out of a chair and make a touch up on your painting without even thinking about it? It's all intuition. And artists should really learn to trust their intuition. You've got it inside you and it'll come out, you'll see. And I, by the way, even though I paint realistically, I love abstract painting. I love looking at abstract painting. I think people should paint with what they want to do, not what they t uh, either are taught to do or think they ought to do because their teacher decides that that's the only way to paint. All that is, is basically both. If you want to become an artist, you paint what you want to do. And I have always, since I was a child, wanted to paint really figures. You know, so I, I really stuck to that. I studied actually with uh, some very famous abstract painters, uh, including Joseph Albers. Uh, I'll, and I'll tell you the truth that I was at Cooper Union, which was a stronghold of abstract expressionism. That was in the 1950s. Uh, I don't think it's a good thing for artists to do exactly what the teacher, I'm a teacher, so I think I can say this. The teacher is not always right. They're often really, almost in the long run, a lot of them are idiots almost, <laughs> you would have to say. And even I have made statements that are completely ridiculous, I realize. So uh, I think in a sense, you have to learn when you go to art school, if you decide to become an artist, to be like a sponge. And you take from what you are taught what deals with you all, and just throw the rest away. Just throw all the rest uh, away. So, uh, and, and I, I can almost write a book to tell you the truth on what I, because I, I think about it a lot, on artists, great artists, who my teachers, both at Cooper Union and Yale, uh, and Pratt, I ended up going to Pratt because I thought I had to get a master's degree. Uh, I only uh, had a, a, a bachelor's, you know, in order to get promoted. But uh, uh, only what my teachers said about other artists, I mean, it's really incredible. I remember I studied art history with George McNeil. Some of you might know who he is. He's a, 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 a basically a a second generation abstract expressionist, but he loved Van Gogh. He really loved Van Gogh. Albus, who's this big shot, you know, he studied at the bar house, he tells us in class, he says, Van Gogh is all schmutzed over with emotion. He's not really a great painter. That's a lot of bullshit. You know, it's not that I don't like Albus' paintings, I, ex I I wouldn't go out of my way to see them today, <laughs> but, but I'll tell you this, I do respect him for sticking to his fact that putting in one color and another color, another color in squares is painting. That's his business, and since he really loved color, that was his business, and he really liked, but it could go on and on, and I want to don't keep going on and on with this. Now, this is my recent work, and I should, uh, I have had to make a change. I mean, you have to admit at a certain point in life that you can't do what you did when you were younger. That's number one. You know, and I, re and I have actually, Dean is over there. Is Maggie with you? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Dean is actually the reason, and the painting of Dean is in the other room. Dean is the first artist that I did this with. Because Dean came to me and said, I did this wonderful painting of my, my mom on the walls of Terracycle. Of, of I don't know if any of you know where Terracycle is in Trenton, but the guy who runs Terracycle allows graffiti artists to use his walls to paint on, which is fine. He's really a good guy. He's actually from Canada. But he, uh, you know, but he's, you know, 
and, and so it used to be illegal, you know, to do uh, uh, graffiti art. Now they're paying them to do it. People want it. <laughs> that just shows you how stupid, you know, uh, people are in a certain way. It's it's now, you know, they're the best. They're they're the best younger artists I know of in trend. But Dean came to me and said, "Will you do this painting of me in front of my mom?" I said, "Well, listen, I can't go to." Terrorism. I don't paint from photographs, but I told Dean that he has to he has to come to my house and sit in a chair. I live on Abernathy Drive in the other part of Trenton, and he sat on a chair. And they said, just give me a photograph of the painting you did of your mother and the area around it. And I did that. And then I did that. I did, and I, and you can see it in the other room. It came out good, and then finally, uh, his his father unfortunately passed, and then I thought, my God, it'd be a great idea if I did a painting of him with his father. I, th I mean, he'll do a graffiti painting of his dad at some point. I said, just bring me a photograph of it. So, so Dean and Maggie came to my house. They sat on my couch. It happened at the drive, and it looks like the couches in the street. Actually, <laughs> which, uh, who gives a, a painting is not reality. You know, it's not the real thing. You can do anything you goddamn please. Actually, in a painting, you know, the famous painting by Magritte says, "See the, the puzzle beep." This is not a pipe. Of course, it's not a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. You know, so the same thing was this. What does it matter where they are? So they posed in my house, and I did the image of his father, which is larger than the one of his mother, because I wanted Maggie uh, in the painting. And since then, everybody has had to come to my house. <laughs> and I have been very lucky. I don't know, is Larry here? No, I guess he's not. He's still probably in the hospital. But Larry Hilton has been a big help to me, because Larry, has introduced me to all these musicians. I can't believe it, who he wants me to paint. There's one of them over there. That's my, uh, the painting I did of Kelvin Bell, who's a guitarist. I did a, a painting of him in my house. That fish that's over the door was given to me by Alan Bennett. Some of you might remember who Alan Bennett was. He was a student of mine at Mercer County Community College. And he went and he hung that fish in my house. I never painted it before, but I thought it fitted with that painting. So Kelvin had to come to my house. I loved the garment that he was wearing, so I made him stand and, uh, and holding the guitar. I mean, in my paintings, actually, I should tell you the truth. One of my students even said this. It's almost like a portrait with the background tells you about the person. You know, the, you, you, you wouldn't really know, well, with a musician, it's different. Musicians, actually, I noticed when I paint them, they end up looking like, the, like, like he was a guitar, that the guitar is part of them. Like, in other words, they belong to the guitar. And I painted somebody, I painted a guy, JP, with a, a bass a saxophone, Except those people, and somebody also with the, uh, the, the saxophone, it's not in the show. I'm painting somebody now with a tennis saxophone, that's the saxophone that Bill Clinton played. Uh, and, and, the, and the thing about it is, I'm, I'm making up the background. I'm putting the background from a painting that I did. I like Ibsen a lot, the, the Norwegian playwright. So I did, did uh, paintings of productions of Ibsen's plays that were done at Mercer County Community College. So I did a painting of Rosmer's on my, this one guy standing in the theater at Mercer County Community College and behind of the seats of the theater and the stuff like that. And I'm putting it behind all my musicians. Now the painting uh, that, uh, that you can see that's right behind you there, he came, the big painting, uh, of, uh, and that's my photographer, the guy who photographs my paintings. His name is Ron Eckert. He, run, he runs 
Taylor Photographic. I don't know if you know that place. But the biggest adventure in, in Ron's life was actually he went to the Amazon River about maybe, I think maybe t almost 20 years ago. I forgot how long ago it was. But that was the big adventure of his life. He brought a, a group of photographers with him. And people don't realize that the Amazon actually goes into Peru. It starts actually in the Andes Mountains in Peru. And then its main journey is through Brazil. So I ended up, I love painting maps. So I painted a map of South America there, put it, uh, putting in where the Amazon is. It goes through, it goes through uh, Peru and Brazil. And I put in the word Amazon. And on the top four images that I, I put there, I, I, I used photographs that he did and uh, in the Amazon. I simplified them with the background. I made the background all blue. But the images themselves all were done from a photograph. Now, I'm very interested in family. And I think maybe the reason for that is that because I got a family, my son and all my grandsons and my daughter were here yesterday. But uh, Ron has two sons, and so I put photographs of his two sons in it. He came to my house, like uh, 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 like Ross came to my house, and and I and I painted him sitting in a chair, and then I, it took me two days to paint him. It took me a day to paint that camera. <laughs> now, I'll tell you the truth. He had to bring the camera to my house. You know, now I'll tell you something about the colors I use. It, this might be a different. I, I have been known actually for using a limited palette. I, in 19, I used, when I first started, I, I first started painting when I went to Cooper Union in Yale. And I'll tell you this, I must admit this. When I went to Yale and I studied with Joseph Albers, as, uh, as authoritarian as he was, and let me tell you, he was authoritarian, he never stopped me from painting the figure, never. When I was at Cooper Union, my teacher, Morris Cantor, told me, you know, you can't paint the figure. And why can't I paint the figure? He said, because you'll try to get a likeness. What the hell's wrong with that? <laughs> but you know, so, you know, and at Cooper Union, by the way, if you were thrown out of Cooper Union, if you failed one class, you were thrown out because it was a free school when I went there. But when I went to Yale, I'll tell you the truth, Albus, he did say to me, he did tell me, he said, the, f the figure is 19th century. And I kept thinking, that's a lot of bullshit, first of all. <laughs> Who are the two greatest painters? of the 20th century. It's Picasso and Matisse, and they are both figurative painters. They distort the figure, that's true, but they are figurative painters. In fact, Picasso did like a non-objective painting. You know, so what does he mean? Figurative painting has been here since the beginning of time. You know, it's not just something, it's something, it's something that people want to do. And so, uh, Albuquerque said, when you're a human being, you want to see the face. He's the one who told me that. I didn't learn a goddamn thing about color from him. And everybody says, he must have taught you a lot about it. He told me nothing about color. I mean, what, what's, you know, he's filling in four squares. You know, what is that, that, that? I mean, his paintings are really good. But, you know, that's his business. I didn't want it. That has nothing to do with getting color in space and stuff like that. So, uh, but he did tell me this. He said, when you're painting the figure, we want to see the head, which is true. If you end up, when you're looking at a painting of the figure, and you end up, let's say, looking at the pants, you're looking at the wrong place. <laughs> you're supposed to really end up looking. The head really has to, in a certain sense, be the focal point of the painting. It really just is. You know, you have to do that. Now, this goes back to the way I use color. I had originally started using color. I used color, originally I would use between, uh, I would say eight maybe, when I decided to paint realistically, 
and I, you know, I couldn't paint realistically. I mean, I would have failed all my classes if I tried to paint like I paint now. But the thing was, uh, if if I, uh, I, I, I was using between, let's say, I think between eight and seven or nine and seven colors, and then all of a sudden in 1990, I, in 1980, I came up with an epiphany. Every 10 years, something happens to artists. I was doing these paintings, and all of a sudden I realized, even though I'm mainly interested in doing the figure, what mainly interests me is the background. In a way, I'm really very interested in the background. So then I changed my method of painting. I would make a drawing of a background first. Then I'd have a person come, and I'd do a drawing. I did a drawing of them in that background, wherever it was, in, their ha in my house, and I would go all over. I have traveled really down to Washington, D.C. when I did a painting of Rush Holt, because uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, uh, Reed and Rush Holt were the only politicians, I hope there's not a politician here, who my wife could stand. She said the ones who she thought were good. And so I think I, I ought to paint them because I wanted to do a painting of a politician. I'd like to do something. And so I had to go down to Washington to paint Reed in his office so I could see the, uh, the Capitol building or something outside his office window. I made that into a, a diptych. I also painted him in Trenton and I showed uh, the, the state capitol, which had to go in the street, in fact, uh, to paint that, which I can't do that anymore. And with the mayor, by the way, in the background of him, now people don't know this, I, I don't think, realize, Trenton is a major art center. It really is. Besides having all really being a center of the graffiti art, which is really one of the major art forms now, of, 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 of modern art, of contemporary art. Trenton is an art center, and in the council chambers, in, uh, in, in City Hall, which is someplace near here, is, is a painting by Everett Shin. A lot of people don't know who Everett Shin is, but he was an important American painter. He did a painting, a mural, in council chambers. It's the first, he did it in 1911. It's the first painting done of this in which uh, what was shown are the industries of the city. In other words, Trenton was a center. After Liverpool, England, Trenton, which is often, you know, derived, oh, you live in Trenton, really. You know, I, I was the center, really, after Liverpool, England, of the porcelain industry in the world. And it was also a center of the, uh, of, of the steel industry. The uh, steel beams of the, of the Roblins lived here. My God, and they made the beams of that. And so those industries are shown in that mural. And it's a historic mural because it's the first mural done in any place dealing with the industries of the city, you know, in any city hall in the country. So when I painted the mayor, as you'll see there, I did go to City Hall. I sat in front of the mayor, and I made the poor guy sit for me. Uh, you know, for, for, yeah, I think he had to sit for two two sessions, and he brought he had to bring with him a book. He, you know, I wanted to show that the guy's intelligent, that he reads. You know, so he brought a book with him, and I figured, great, I'll put the book in too. So I, I then, and my friend Dan Aubrey, I don't think Dan is here now, but my friend Dan Aubrey got me photographs, really, of the bureau behind him. I, I did paint the, that architectural element when I painted at City Hall, but I then ended up uh, changing the colors. The walls of the building is not yellow, let me tell you that. And they do not have a red, uh, you know, division over there. And also, even the mural itself, I had to change the mural in some ways. I kept the basic ideas of it in because I had to make it fit in with my painting. 
you know, so I, I, I outlined some things in black and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, and so I did that. But now, in 19, I said in not, what I used to do in painting, I just want to go back a bit, in, in 1980, I started painting, the, drawing the background first. Then I drew the person. Then the person came to wherever I was painting them, and I painted them in front of whatever it was that, that I had done. And I made a color study for the painting and all that sort of stuff. And then in 1990, I had another epiphany. I consider these epiphanies. I decided that what I would do, instead of using seven or eight colors or more, I'd use four colors which I was really proud of. I used a dark red, a, do a dark blue, or a cobalt blue, either one worked, and a, a, a yellow, and a white. And when you mix red, a dark red with a, with, with a blue, you get basically a dark purple that kind of looks like black. You know, it looks like a black. I figure, isn't this brilliant? You know, I was very proud of myself. You know, that I, I, you know, because people would come and look at my paintings, and I know even other artists would say when I said, I've only done this with my gallery dealer, you know, uh, would sometimes say to people, he only done, uses four colors, because, you know, uh, I was really proud of the fact that I could do that. Then Margaret O'Reilly, is Margaret here? No, I guess she couldn't come today either. So, uh, uh, so Margaret, uh, who's been a big help to me often. Uh, she runs the State Museum now. Margaret said, why don't you use black? And my first reaction to that was, I'll tell you the truth, I really felt, what? I would use black and then ruin my reputation <laughs> as being a painter of just four colors? But then I decided to use black. And I really like it better. <laughs> so the black which is behind uh, Ron is pure black, that is a carbon black, and then the white is a pure white. Now I gotta tell you this, I have a friend whom I think is a wonderful painter, he's my friend George Nick, he's a realist painter, he once told me, he said I wouldn't use, a, I would slit my wrist before I use a pure white. And I, I said to myself, I didn't want to insult him because I like him a lot. I said, go with him. You know, it's really ridiculous. It's stupid. White is a color. It's not just technically speaking all colors in one. Black is a color. It's not just the absence of color. It is a color. And then I did was doing a series of paintings I must admit I then cheated even more later on on my four color things at, uh, at uh, Lawrenceville High School. I became the artist in residence. And one of the rooms that the students were always in uh, had this uh, checkerboard floor with green and white uh, checkers on it. And I figured, my God, if I have to keep mixing green and uh, I mean red and blue, red and yellow, I mean, uh, no, red, red and, uh, blue, and blue, blue and blue and yellow. <laughs> if I have to mix blue and yellow over and over again, I won't be able to get it. I might as well be buy a green. So I ended up buying <laughs> Jenkins green, which I really like. Not in all, not in none of these paintings. I started using sometimes Jenkins green, which I actually kind of like a lot. So you know, I'll tell you the truth. Rules are meant to be broken. You gotta understand that. Rules are meant to be broken. And everything that everybody, and I, I'll tell you this from my own experience. Even as an artist, you sometimes have to be careful of criticism. I mean, sometimes I'll tell you the truth. You know, somebody can say, you know, uh, you know, I don't like this. I like paintings with a soft edge or something. Good, you don't like it. That's your business. It has nothing to do with me. You know, you really, you really have to be careful. And even sometimes, like I trust both my daughter and I trust Dan Aubrey a lot 
you know, when they look at my paintings. But sometimes when they like my paintings, I figure I don't like them. And so at the end result, when you're doing a painting, you have to like it. You're the one who has to like it. You can't go look at it and say, well, my daughter thinks this is terrific. Really? Like the, 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 you know, it's really ridiculous. You know, it's just that I think they have good eyes, that's all. And you know, and, and I, I trust them. And by the way, the other thing about being an artist is this, that when you're a painter, uh, I'll tell you the truth, nobody gives a damn whether you're painting, nobody. You have to realize that. My parents didn't want me to be an artist. They didn't want me to be an artist. They wanted me actually, uh, you know, to be uh, whatever. To be a doctor. Uh, that would have been made, that would have made them thrilled to death. If I remember, I, uh, really. But the thing is, nobody wants you to be a, be an artist. And though my wife was very supportive, I must admit, I married a woman that was really very supportive of my paintings. You know, if I didn't paint, she wouldn't have. She wouldn't have really been upset. You know, you have to be true about this. You have to care. You have to care. It's your willpower that counts. You have to get into the goddamn painting room. You know, and you have to paint. It's an act of will, really. It's really an act of will, and uh, uh, that's my advice. <laughs> I mean, whatever my advice is. And then uh, all these paintings that I've done here, uh, like the painting over at the right, over there, next to the painting at the right of the mayor, of the mayor is a painting of, uh, of somebody actually who uh, Larry Hilton introduced me to. That's Yusuf Kumanyaka. How many people know who Yusuf Kumanyaka is? Yusuf Kumanyaka is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Yes. He lives in Trenton. Yes. Christ! He lives, in, he lives 15 minutes from my house. It's unbelievable. So I got him to pose for me. So I went to his house, but then I decided this. When I did the painting at that time, I only considered painters to be part of my artist series. I do paintings in series. You know, mainly people who are artists or what, or the people from the high schools and, and stuff like that, people from Al Jaira, my family, you know, and stuff like that. I have a whole series of paintings doing things with that. So I wanted to write it. So what I had to do, if you look at that painting, on the right of the painting, I copied one of, uh, one of Yusuf's poems. And I'll tell you the truth, it took me longer to copy that poem than it did to paint him. You know, because I'm so used to actually just, you know, pe doing, and also, by the way, I stopped doing this. After a while, and I owe this to my son. He's not here, so uh, he was here yesterday. So it, it won't be insulted. I, uh, I, one time, I had a bit, I was supposed to do a painting of my son and uh, uh, his basically ex-wife at the time, or his first girlfriend or whatever. And so uh, I knew that my son, I love him to death, but he's not reliable. He would tell me, Dad, we're moving tomorrow. Really, what am I supposed to do with this goddamn painting? You know, if you move. So I decided to get rid of either doing a drawing or doing actually a color study. I, and I figured by this time I should know how to paint. So I painted directly on the canvas. You know, I got them there. And so all these paintings were done that are in this room are basically done in that technique. In other words, there was no preparatory drawing. I just painted from the people directly. And I'll tell you the truth, there is this. I, it's true I had to learn how to draw. And I consider the basis of realistic painting is learning how to, of course, be able to draw. But actually, I think I, I actually draw better with a brush, to be honest, than when I'm using a pencil. And actually, one of my teachers at Cooper Union, even Morris Cantor, you know, so, told me to draw with a brush once. So, and I never realized that. So I really kind of like drawing with paint, actually, and I find it very easy. 
and and very quick to uh, uh, quick to do. So I got rid of that. But right next though to to uh, Yusuf is a map of is his poem, which I left some off. By the way, I left some off to make believe that the blue. The blue did not exist in his house, I'll tell you that much. He doesn't have a big, big thing in the middle of his home, his home, you know, that goes over this poem on it. But I had to do that. And then I copied, actually, one of Tom. How many people here know who Tom Malloy is? Anybody? Oh, great. Tom Malloy was known as the Dean of Trenton Bangers. He's passed, unfortunately. But that's Tom Malloy's watercolor, which actually, uh, 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 Yusuf did not own, but I wanted to show that Yusuf actually lives in Trent, and that's the battle monument. You know what people don't realize? If it wasn't for Trent, there'd be no United States. <laughs> this, uh, you know, because it was it was when Washington crossed the Delaware and fought the Battle of Trenton first, and because he caught a pack of Hessian soldiers. Trump, you know, he won the battle. You know, that was the turning point of the war. And other than that, Washington was not a really good general. You know, he was losing one battle after another, and that turned the tide of the war. Okay, on the left side of, of, of the painting of the mayor is the painting of T.C. Is T.C. around? Where is he? Where? Oh, here's T.C. Every time I have a show someplace, I have to do a painting of the, of the, uh, of the place. So I had T.C. I had to show you once before of the work of my graffiti artist. So T.C. posed for that you know, over there, and I copied one of the paintings of, uh, that, I, that was in the show. Of the of the that the, the that uh, actually Dean in fact had done of me, except one the only thing I changed in that I'll tell you the truth was well one of the things I changed is that the sky in the painting was actually yellow, but I noticed that the yellow was too strong, and it was popping out, so I changed it to red. But it's a, it's a painting. It's not a it's not a record. Remember that. It's a, a photograph, though I like my daughter, you know, people do photographs. And by the way, what I used to teach, which is also nonsense, is that if you paint from photographs, it's, uh, 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 it's what you, you, you shouldn't paint from photographs. That's nonsense. <laughs> my, my, and I'll tell you, my favorite painter, one of my favorite painters, is Thomas Akins, whom I consider hands down to be America's greatest painter. He reuses photographs, he didn't care. You know, I mean, I mean, he could draw perfectly, so what does that matter? Now, um, the other paintings in the room, oh, that's my grandson. Now, I have five grandchildren. I had my, uh, they were all here yesterday, you know, it was kind of nice. But my, my daughter's sons, she has two sons, they have, uh, you know, regular type of hair that people <laughs> would have. But my son, who is a professional tattoo artist, by the way, he lets his children do whatever they got their place. So <laughs> they have hair down to their shoulders that I think any girl would envy, by the way, see? But it's unbelievable hair. So I painted the two of them. The one, and, and I did those paintings because they asked me to. My, my grandson called me up and said, Grandpa, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to paint, uh, do a painting of me with a red Corvette. Now, I have no idea what a red Corvette is. I know as much about cars as, as nothing. And so I said, I'll paint you. So, so what happened was, is that uh, uh, Zev, that, that's, uh, that's him over there. He came actually to my daughter's house. I painted him in my daughter's house. I put him on the couch in my house, if I painted him. 
And then I got a photograph of a red Corvette, because I didn't know what it was. What was I going to find one? And do that. And then on the other wall, and then my other grandson, his brother, gets on the phone, who's younger than him, and he says to me, Grandpa, I want you to do me a favor. You know, he says, I want you to paint me with a dragon. Where the hell am I going to find a dragon? But I'll tell you the truth. I have four grand, I have five grandchildren. I have four grandsons. I mean, they're all one. I love them all. They're all wonderful. But I have one granddaughter, and I think, I say this not only because she, every, everybody who sees her work, she's like a genius. She can draw unbelievably. She can draw incredibly. And she loves animals. And she did a drawing of a dragon. So I said, great. Get me a, get me a photo of, of Rayona's drawing of a dragon. And so I did the same thing. So they got put that way. And then, uh, oh, when we come here to this bit, painting on my left, over here, the people in this painting, now this is a little complicated. Uh, the guy who's in the painting is a novelist. His name is Will Heinrich. He was actually, he's also an art critic. That's how he makes his money. At the time that I did this painting, he was an art critic of the New York Observer. Okay, which is, I don't know if it still exists or something. So, and his wife actually uh, 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 came from a country called Moldova. Does anybody ever heard of it, Moldova? Yeah. Yeah, Moldova should be famous now because of uh, Putin, who I consider a Nazi, really. Is, uh, you know, is, is, is threatening them, too. And so they, they want to join the EU. They're a small country in what used to be at Bessarabia. That's where his wife was born. So I ended up putting a map of Bessarabia, of, of Moldova in there, and I made sure you knew it was Moldova. You know what the red was over there. And he had written, now, the thing about Will is he then became a critic of the New York Times. And the, and the truth of the matter is, he did write a review of my show in New York. It was a very good review. But, uh, but he had written a review before, long before that of, uh, uh, of, the, of, of German paintings by uh, Franz Mark and, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, Maka. Uh, I think it's Otto Maka. I'm not really August. sure. What? August. August Maka. Yeah, August Maka. Yeah, which I saw, which I really like at the Neue Gallery in New York. So I put in a painting by Maka, who, who I really thought was, I, I love German Expressionism. Oh, that's another group, by the way, that Albus couldn't stand. Uh, I rem I'll tell you this story, because, because you know, I have free reign, I guess, here. My, my, uh, at Yale, we all had booths. And everybody had reproductions of paintings by old masters in the boats, you know, of people who they, they, they liked. And one of the kids had a reproduction of a, a Max Beckman, you know, who was, well, I never seen Albus like this. He literally had a fit. He screamed in the class. He says, don't you know he's a terrible painter? You know, he mixes white and all his colors and puts black lines around everything. August, uh, 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 Max Beckman is, by the way, the greatest considered, the greatest German painter of the 20s. He's a knockout painter. He's, uh, but Albus couldn't stand him. I always thought, to tell you the truth, that was jealousy. Because when, when, when Max Beckman came to this country, which he did, you know, a lot of Germans came here because of the Nazis. He was lionized by the Americans right away. They were good. When Albus originally came here, even though he was a student of Paul Klee and Vasily Kandinsky, it took him a long time before, be, until minimalism came in, before he and Apart, before he received recognition. 
So I kept thinking maybe that was it, that he was, but he couldn't stand it. And my God, my poor friend had a, had a, a by the way, I, I'll finish this story because it was, it was, there was something even funnier about it. Behind the paintings of, 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 uh, of, of, of Max Beckman, he had all these photographs. I, uh, Barry Shackman was the student's name. He was a friend of mine at, at Yale. He did have a he did have a photograph of Hitler. And one thing about 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 Albus, he, he was definitely he was not a Nazi. He hated the Nazi. His wife, Annie Albus, is Jewish. So you know, but if he had come across that photograph, which which actually. I'm sure Barry brought it as a joke. You know, Albus would have had a fit. That kid would have been thrown out of school. You know, it's kind of amazing, but uh, uh, that's the way things go. But uh, now, I, I want to say something more about this painting, though. When I get, get my models to come and pose for me, I don't really, uh, I don't tell them exactly how I want them to pose. You know, I don't like, first of all, I don't think professional models, uh, they don't look like people. You know, they really don't. You know, because models are used to, you know, you're in an art class when you have all these nudes posing for you and, and sometimes ridiculous poses that a human being really wouldn't get into. I like, I didn't tell them, I didn't tell his daughter to hold her daddy's leg. I, know, I wanted to paint Celia too. She just was holding her, her father's leg. I thought, my God, that would make me terrific. So I quickly painted her in, you know, because children are not known for their long journey. <laughs> now, this is one of my favorite paintings. Where, is Aubrey here? Right here. Oh, there they are. Now, I have done, I, Aubrey Kaufman is a really good friend of mine, and uh, I think he's, uh, shit. I think he's New Jersey's best living photographer. Yeah. 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 And I've done lots of paintings of Aubrey. In fact, Margaret picked one of them that I did of him at Mason Gross with all his photographs in them for my show in New York. But I also wanted to do a painting, actually. I did a painting of Aubrey um, with, his, uh, with, his, with his wife, but then all of a sudden, with Michelle, but then all of a sudden I thought, uh, I'd like to do her by herself, and I had painted Pam, actually, uh, in the 1980s, I think. I had done a painting of her. It was in my show in New York of the Players Company. Does anybody ever remember what that was? That was a theater group that used some ch a church. Uh, and I was put on the board of the church. And so I figured all I could do is I can get these people to pose for me. That, you know, that's basically what I'm doing. Like, and so, but and Pam looks almost the same, I think, now. Like my daughter, she looks almost the same now as when I, and, and my son is, I don't, you know, maybe when you get old, I'm beginning to think, you think everybody looks young. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you the truth, it really becomes like a, you know, no, nobody, nobody looks their, nobody seems to look their age. But I really love this painting. And the truth of the matter is, that first of all, I did start this painting in Aubrey's house. I said, it's true. But he doesn't have blue walls. I took the, uh, I, I moved actually the pattern from something else to the couch in this painting over here. And the floor is not, he didn't have a red floor with blue dots in it. I put that in. And the landscape outside the, outside the window, I basically made up. That was it. And I made up the colors. And that's what I really like doing now. That's part of my thing now. I mean, I, I really, it's, 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 and I think maybe one of the reasons 
might be this. First of all, if I, first of all, I don't think somebody, if you're an artist, you should paint the same way all your life, especially if you live as long as I'm living. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's really incredible. You know, I mean, Picasso changed his, his style, you know, every, uh, it was always basically figurative, but every uh, 20, uh, 20 years or so, or something, you know, we went through the Cuba stage, the neoclassical stage, the Cuba stage, and stuff like that. Matisse actually remained quite consistent all his life in his paintings. He does, but not Picasso. So, it, you know, it, it's just a thing that just happens. You really uh, end up doing, uh, it's not good for you, I think. If I had a, you know, in other words, I have to think of, of this too. I'm not gonna live forever, obviously. I would like to live until I can stop painting. And then I hope it will not be, I, I, I get hope from the fact that, I don't know if how many, how many of you know who the artist Carmen Herrera was. If you know that, Carmen Herrera died at 101 or 103, I forgot. Uh, but no, she died at 103, it was Bernardo died at 101. She died at 103. Two years before she died, her paintings were bought by, two of her paintings were bought by the National Academy in Washington. And she was thrilled. And my goal is to live as long as she did. <laughs> because I'll tell you the truth, no. Work is actually a high form of pleasure. It, you know, in this country, they think everything is vacation. You know, after a while, when you go on vacation, don't you get bored? You know, you figure, oh, I can't wait I get home again and tell everybody about my vacation. You know, it's a big deal, but you know. Uh, but, but work never, you know, if you enjoy it, only if you enjoy it. And you know, I always liked teaching. I, I, I only became a teacher, to be honest, because I was getting married and I thought I needed a full-time job. Because I, I didn't realize I would really love teaching so much. You know, and you end up having bonds with your students and stuff, which really can last forever. So, uh, it's, uh, whatever. Okay. So let's go on. What, what's on that wall over there? Oh, oh, yeah. Over there is another person I got. That's a, that's a painting. I did of uh, 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 Gatewood. He was a, he's a friend of Larry Hilton's. He's a, a painter. He's the only painter. He's, no, he's the only painter. He's, Larry has sent me, but I'd like to have a show of all the paintings because I have several on work at home of people that Larry gave me, including the painting he did of Larry of just, of called Larry Hilton and Fred. But uh, I got a book, I painted Lamarol. He came to my studio. I do not have a green couch, <laughs> to tell you the truth. It's the same red couch, by the way, that's in the painting over there of the artist from Poland. It's the same couch. What the hell, you can, that couch has a pattern. But I kept thinking that the pattern would get in the way of the figures, so I wanted the green in there. And then I copied uh, two of, uh, of Lamoureux's paintings from a book that he gave me on his work. That was it. You know, and I really liked the idea that the background, if you, you just by looking at Lamoureux, you wouldn't know that he's a painter. You wouldn't. You really have to see his work. And then you, you wouldn't know he's an abstract painter. You'd think, oh, Mel is painting another realist painter. No, I like his paintings very much. He's an abstract painter. That's what he loves doing. And he's terrific. Now, next to that painting is the painting. I, I had done a painting of my daughter. I have two children, my daughter Francesca. And so I had done a painting before of, of me with my daughter. You know, people say, how do you do a, a self-portrait? It's very easy. 
you look in the mirror. What do you mean? And I'll tell you one thing about doing a self-portrait. First, first of all, I know that you won't complain. The art, the model won't complain how the artist did it. You know, it's different when you paint people. You'd be amazed how many complaints I keep getting sometimes. You know, from people. You know that you know I didn't do them justice, or I did something wrong with them. You know, but when you do yourself, I don't give a crap how I came out. I, just as so long as I sat still. You know, and I know I will sit still for my painting. So that was it. But I did because I did my son, my daughter. I figured I had to do my son. Now, what I did was behind him, I put. Uh, a frame around him. That was the same frame that I used when I painted my daughter. But when I painted my daughter, we were up, I used to go to Cape Cod all the time. We were up at Cape Cod, that's where she posed for me. And then, uh, and by the way, my daughter told me how she wanted to look, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, your, ch your children do not hold back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but that doesn't matter. So I wanted to do one of my son. So I, I painted him at my daughter's house, but then uh, when I finished the painting, I made believe that he was on on the deck at my house in the backyard. And the landscape behind him is a landscape which I changed into, uh, you know, with the green and black and stuff like that which I changed into a, uh, you know, uh, into, into black. I, I, and, and uh, uh, you know, I think you can do anything you, if you're, one of the things about modern painting, now you remember it's different in different ages and in different countries. We supposedly, of course, if we get a certain person as president again, it might not be true, but we supposedly live in a free country. And, and, and the Western world is noted for the fact that it's democratic. So that modern times were different than ancient Egypt, let's say, where everybody basically had to follow a formula of painting. In modern times, you don't. And also, starting with Manet, actually, who's the father of modern painting, people have a, are, are, are able to paint anyway. They, they want to. You know, that started the whole process of individual. It's the individual that counts, you know. And so uh, I think that's, that's important for artists. And by the way, I couldn't ever tell this to, to my students. If a student comes to you and wants to be an art, an art major, you can't tell that student when they graduate. You know, like if they want to become, let's say, a computer expert. Well, you'll be making this much money every year, you know. You can't say that. It's not a money-making business. It has nothing to do with money. You know, in fact, artists who are really very commercially oriented are usually shitty artists, probably. <laughs> you know, they do crap. You know, they were like, uh, you know, you, you're, it's not certain what you'll make, you know. They're all artists. I remember I once had, when I lived in New York, there was this guy who, I lived in a loft on 4th Avenue. There was in, in Manhattan, and this was before I got married, and there was a guy who, who rented a loft upstairs. And all he did for a living, he did this for a living. He didn't live in the loft. He got paintings that he, he lined up according to size. You know, and he did all these fraudulent scenes of Paris. And then he would sign the paintings on Ray. You know, and, make, and, and then it, they were sold to these places that thought they were getting something by a French artist. You know, it was all nonsense. He couldn't stand it, in fact. And he said, I can't wait till, but it was, it made him money. He actually, he was able to afford that apartment you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the 1960s, apartments were as expensive as they are now in New York. But it, it's still, 
it still was, was money and not a place to live, but that was enough money. So uh, I don't know what to call on, but you know, it's something, uh, it's something you just, if you're an artist, you must be obsessive. You just must be obsessive. It's something you really have to do. I mean, it, 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 it sometimes is difficult on your family, I think, you know, because like, you know, Sunday is supposedly a day of rest. Sunday is simply another day for an artist to paint. That's a big deal, you know, so, uh, 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 and that's it. Okay. <laughs>